Hello, my name's Dina. What's nice to name? meet you, Dina. My name is George. George Saunders. Uh, when and where were you born? I was born on the island of St. Kitts. It was discovered by Christopher Columbus and um, he named it the island after himself, owing to the fact that he had loved that island very much. And the year that I was born is 1931. How did you find growing up in St. Kitts and Nevis? For me, it was happy days as a child because um, in spite that my parents, my mother particularly, she worked in the sugar industry and my father had emigrated to Antigua. So most of my education came from Antigua with my dad, who was a tailor. Can you tell me about your father? I was a tailor and he set up business in Basseterre, which is the capital of St. Kitts. And uh, I know of him from about seven or so. And uh, he had other workers with him because he was very successful in his tailor work. Um, you said that your father had a shop in St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, mm. Did you help out in the shop at all? Uh, not at the age of seven. All I was thinking of is to play around in the shop. And in actual fact, I used to make those clothes when I was a boy eight, nine, coming up, because this tailoring is always seem as though it's in the family. I believe your father went to work in Antigua, um, can you tell us the reasoning behind it? My dad is a man who loved to travel, and it was during the war that he decided that he would go to Antigua, where the Americans were based during that period. and. Um, he had done quite a lot of work for the army and for civilian type people as well. Did you miss your father? Very much so. We were a very close knit family. And the same as though my dad had loved me being the first child and uh, he wanted me to be with him and probably, I don't know, he wanted me to follow in his footsteps. So you went out to Antigua to join him? You joined him in Antigua? Yes, we joined him in Antigua, I think it was about 1940 or something like that. Okay, and how did you find growing up there? Oh, quite good, except that when uh, others are playing cricket and football and basketball, skipping and all that sort of thing, that was not in his head. My father wanted me to be a tailor like himself. And for that reason, after school, I would have to go to work with him in the tailor shop. Okay, and did you enjoy this? I saw, yes, I loved it. What kind of work did you do in the shop? Um, I used to make clothes after school with my dad. And um, he also worked for the American the Army base and uh, did sort of alterations and uh, likewise if there's a, a man that's got a bad figure he of course would make something for him from scratch. Okay, and did you get paid well? I don't know at that time. I wasn't thinking of payment. I was thinking of learning a trade. And what happened when the war ended? Well, we were still in Antigua. Um, we didn't suffer much of a hardship, really, during the war. The only problem that we had is that the, the ships that bring us the goods, they're being always delayed. And of course, on the island itself, we had lots of uh, vegetables and fruits and whatever. So we were Okay. okay, and when did you go back to St. Kitts and Nevis? Well, my dad, he loves to travel and he wanted to go, not wanted, he did go to Trinidad and so I had to go back with my mom to live with her 
during the time he was in Trinidad. And he tried to get a foothold in the tailoring trade in Trinidad. But after a couple of years, he couldn't get any work. So therefore, he decided to go back to St. Kitts and took me again with him. Okay, was it nice to be back together as a family unit? Oh yes, because I'd love my dad. He was a very um, strict in a way, but at the same time, a lovable father. What happened to your father after he went to Trinidad? He couldn't settle as a tailor in Trinidad, and so he decided that he would come back to Antigua. And uh, of course, when he came back, he took me back with him in Antigua and I think we left Antigua when I was 19 to go back to St. Kitts to settle there because he wasn't keeping well and of course I couldn't look after him myself alone. I wanted the family to be part of it to help me along. Soon after he died and I had to find work elsewhere. Okay, so what did this mean for you? Where did you go? Oh, I missed him quite a lot, really. But, you know, that comes to all of us at some stage or another. And uh, I had to try and make my way through life. And I got jobs with other tailors that were established in Thinkets. And uh, I wasn't doing too badly. When did you get married? I got married in 1956. At that time, I was already established as a tailor on my own. And uh, we both got together and we decided that we would get married. Even before I traveled, I had a son. He was six months old at the time. I left him and my wife at home and uh, came over to England by, by invitation of a friend of mine. That must have been very hard. Very hard indeed. Did your wife come to join you in England? She did not come to join me in England. Oh yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> she did come to, try, um, to join me um, here in England. Uh, she came over in 1959. And in those days it was very hard to find digs. So the wife and myself and the kid was in one room. And we had to do everything, cooking, washing, everything like that. In those days, it was really tough. So was the transition between um, the Caribbean and England quite difficult? The only problem I found that when I came here is the weather. <laughs> I'd love the sunshine, and of course, I've just left a nice sunshine area where we could go swimming when we want to and things like that. And coming to a dark and dismal place, I thought to myself, I won't stay here. I would work for about three or four years and then go back home. Well, of course, it didn't work out that way, did it? <laughs> How did you get to England? I came by boat. It took us 23 days on sea before we landed at Southampton. And the voyage was good. It's like a little tourist boat. You have a lot to eat, a lot to drink, and they have certain evenings when you go dancing and things like that. So it was quite good. And how did you get the money to afford this trip to England? And my friend who was ahead of me came in 1955, and we corresponded one with another. And uh, he said that he wasn't doing too badly. And I said to him, if things could work out for me, I'll come and join him. So I got my money together. In those days, it was only about, what, 65 pounds, the contained. And uh, I, I came over and joined him at his place where he had already bought a house. And where was that? Why did I come? Where did your friend live? Where did he live? He li oh, he lived in, in, in Birmingham, uh, Borsal Heath Road at the time. And uh, I came and stayed with him for, uh, oh, must have been about three, four weeks before I 
got a room of my own and uh, I settled down. Was it quite difficult to find your own home? Ah, yes. In those days you, you, you couldn't buy a house easily and uh, most of the rooms were let out to other immigrants who were coming in. In one house you could have about 15 or 20 people living. And in those days, uh, when they were working shift work, one man would be at home sleeping, whilst the other man goes to work, or both in the same bed. So were the living conditions quite horrible? The living conditions, I wouldn't say horrible, but they were not things that I used to. But of course I had to adjust myself to them. And how did you find that adjustment? Yeah, oh, pretty tough. Pretty tough. But if you're determined to succeed in anything, you try your very best to to do that. You know, adjust yourself to your situation. Did you suffer from racism? Ah, uh, yes. I couldn't find work as a tailor. Everywhere I applied, they keep asking me if I've got the English experience. And I told them no. And they said, we can't use you. So I decided to take a course from London, a correspondence course in tailoring. And at the time I had a family to look at. And I took a job in a biscuit factory, making cream biscuits. I was there for about a year. During the time I was there, I used to look in the Birmingham Evening Mail to see what jobs were going. And there was one job that came up, and I applied for the job. The interviewee asked me to come, wrote me a letter, asked me to come for an interview. And when I got there, I said to him, my name is George Saunders, you wrote me this letter, asked me to come for an interview. And he looked at me like that, pulled the letter out of my hand, and he said, the job's gone. I was dumbfounded. He asked to come. He didn't even ask me a question. All he said to me, the job's gone. So I stood there looking at him. And he said, get out. I said, the job's gone. And how did you find this? How did you find that experience? Very bad. As a matter of fact, um, I couldn't understand what you what had happened because in our country there isn't any color prejudice. You go according to your knowledge and your experience in life, but not to look at your color and say you can't have this post or whatever the case might be. So I was very very dumbfounded and couldn't understand why this man didn't accept me and not even to give me an interview. Did you experience this at any other time in your life? Oh yes. I used to work for a tailor. Uh, Philip Collier, as his name is. And uh, I was already working with another set of tailors, just doing alterations. But I wanted to go straight into the proper tailoring where I make suits and trousers and things like that. And this man advertised that he wanted a tailor. And so I applied to him, and I went to work for him in King's Eve, his shop at the time. And I was there for about a fortnight when he asked me whether I could do uh, some alteration to some of his customers, because some of the jobs, the customer did not collect them because they didn't fit properly. And so he got the customers to come in one by one, I fit them, make the necessary alterations. I think it was about 12 suits. And they each one took the suits because they were happy with it then. He further said to me, I've got a customer by the name of Mr. Andrews. He said he's been with me now 15 years and I've never ever made him a suit that he was happy with. So he want me to measure up Mr. Andrews and make him a suit. 
So I did. Made him the suit. Mr. Andrews came in. I gave him two or three fittings where the jacket is concerned. And after the suit was finished, Mr. Andrews came in and he did whatever, you know, move his arms around and things like that. He walked the length of the shop, looking at himself in the mirror. And then he turned to Mr. Collier and he said, this is the first time you've ever made me a suit that I'm happy with. And Mr. Collier said to him, Mr. Andrews, I told you that one day I'll make you a suit you'll be happy with. And I stood there, no one, no one whatsoever gave me any kind of congratulations or nothing like that. And um, what did you do after you worked for Philip Collier? I decided that if I need recognition, I had to do something about it. And so, after two years at Philip Collier, I rented a shop in Bottle Heath Road, and my wife would stay there and take messages. And when I come home, she would reveal to me the messages that I have had, and I would go and visit the customers in their own homes in order to get my foothold uh, in the trade itself. Okay, and how did you find this work? How did you find this work? The work, very hard and tough because I had to have um, my regular job with Philip Colliers and at the same time I had to go home uh, and work, visit in the, the customers and things like that. So I used to have a lot of late nights getting in. But in the long run it was worth it. And did you receive any prejudice from your a work outside Mr. Collier's? Yes, I have. Um, and this was when I was in a um, in, uh, shop, is now? Her Street. When I was in Her Street, I was there working, and uh, I heard in those days I used to have a little bell at the top. And when you push the door, you hear the bang. Mm -hmm. So this man pushed the door and came in. And I got up and said, can I help you, sir? He stood up and he looked at me. And he said, can I help you, sir? He looked around the shop and looked around the shop. And then he made to walk back out. I said, what's, he said, strange, strange. I said, what is it that's so strange? He said, I've never seen a black tailor before and walked out. When did you go to the shops, um, which are the back-to-backs in Her Street? It was in 1977 when I moved to um, Her Street. The man that owned the business, I used to work for him as a backup tailor. In those days, he would measure the customer, and that would choose the cloth, write all the measurements down, and give me the cloth to make the suits and the measurements. So I would make the suits for him and then he would deliver them to the customer. He decided that he was going to retire, and so I bought the lease of him to set up on my own. Um, was that very expensive? In those days, I managed to make it, you know, meet my demands, and things begin to grow from there. Um, we used to work for lots and lots of people, uh, even the mods in those days and the teddy boys in those days, they were specializing in their type of work and uh, they would come and show me a photograph or whatever that they want. And then I would settle down and give it to them and uh, they would always be happy. And how long did it take you to make each item of clothing? Well, it's... Uh, how many... well, shall I go on to my employees? We had about 10 people working for us, and each one had his or her own work to do. So it's like a, a mass production type thing. So we couldn't say that a suit would take me two or three days to make, because it was all done on a mass production basis. So was work very fulfilling? Was, did you enjoy your work? Yes, I did. 
there's another little experience that I would like to pass on. And that I contributed to a magazine uh, for tailors. And in there they would advertise uh, work or people for work and so forth. And uh, I saw an advert that they wanted a tailor to make uniforms and I applied for the job. This was based in London. And I telephoned the man and he asked me to come for an interview. So I got in my car and I drove to London and the man saw me. He began to ask me questions of my experience and things like that. And he gave me a sample of a pair of trousers that he won for the army. And he says, this is one pair of trousers. I'd like you to go home and make it exactly like the sample and bring back to me tomorrow. So I drove from London back to Birmingham, made the trousers and went back to London with one pair of trousers. He looked at it. And he said, it's similar to you know what you're doing. Here's another two pairs. So he gave me another two pairs. And I came back to Birmingham with the two pairs, made them up, and took them back. Then he gave me another half a dozen to do. And he wanted them the next week. So we did them for the next week. And then when I delivered, he said to me, where about are you based? Well, I had to tell him I came from Birmingham. And he was shocked. Couldn't believe that I would drive all the way from Birmingham to London with one pair of trousers. He thought I was based in London. But I convinced him that he shouldn't worry. Because every time he wants to work, I was there. And then he gave me that bulk order. And... Uh, and the things went pretty well with us. And um, what were the trousers for? The trousers were for the Queen's Guards. They are made from buckskin leather. And they're very intricate. Uh, the cotton that we use, you won't be able to hold it and break it. It's like a nylon fiber cotton. And the needles that we had to use were three-cornered needles. And um, it's quite a lot of work involved in making those trousers. But um, we did it and then he was always happy with our work. What properties did you own in Hurst Street? I owned 61 to 63 Hurst Street. And uh, as we began to get more customers, we decided that we would take over the next door shop which of course was a news agent and had closed down. And so we extended the shop as into the other section, covering four different uh, areas of the shop itself. Uh, we had the upstairs and we knocked out the middle wall to make it one big shop upstairs. What other um, businesses were there on the premises of Hare Street? Uh, there was a taxi office, and next door to the taxi office was a chip shop. So we used to probably go out in the out court and order our chips and whatever the case might be. But that was the only reason that we go out into the out court itself. And next door to me was a news agent, and uh, just over the road. There was other shops and uh, tailors as well, uh, dressmakers and whatever the case might be. So it was a little communal of people together that was working. And at this time was custom for your shop getting, in, well increasing? Were you getting more and more customers? Oh yes, I did have a lot of customers coming from all over the place, from Warwickshire and things like that. Uh, I had work for uh, a man who came to the Hippodrome, preparing there, 
and uh, I made him a suit and he came all the way from Scotland. Wow. Yeah. Was this due to your order um, from the guards? Uh, that, that was a separate thing. We also had a nice big order from Libya. Uh, in those days, uh, Colonel Gaddafi was a good man. Not like today. <laughs> and uh, I had to make the uniforms through the same man that gave me that one pair of trousers to make. And um, we had to go and deliver every weekend, uh, go out to, uh, to, to, to Heathrow and to post them off uh, to, to Libya in those days. So by this point your business is quite well established. Yes. Um, did you pass any of your tricks of the trade to your children? Uh, yes, my daughter, my youngest daughter, she was working with me and my eldest son as well in the in the trade. And um, now her daughter is studying fashion at Birmingham University. So it's it's like my father being a tailor, I become a tailor, my daughter becomes a, a seamstress, and my granddaughter is now studying fashion. Well, the back to back houses closed down, but why didn't they pull them down? I made to understand that the back to back uh, in her street is one of the only back to back that remains in Birmingham. And uh, the landlords decided that they were to knock it down to make offices, but the trust, National Trust, came in and bought the place owing to the fact that they knew it has a historical value. And so they knocked the old building down and built a new building where it is now in Hell Street. When did you stop working? I stopped working in 2001. I was coming up to retirement. I could have had another shop, but I decided that I might as well give it up, owing to the fact that my health wasn't doing too well. And um, I find retirement quite interesting, really. I like it. So what do you do in your free time now? In the meantime, I used to do a little bit of alterations and the odd suit for the customers who found it very hard or difficult to find a suit to fit them. But um, lately I haven't done much really. Um, what was your wife's name and when did she pass away? It was Mildred. And uh, she had a lot to do with the, 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 the background of my uh, business. And somehow she managed to help somehow, you know, she had a hemorrhage in the air and uh, she died suddenly in 1992. I'm sure you have many fond memories with her. If I? Fond memories with her. Oh yes, 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 yes. We used to go uh, different places. We used to travel together with the kids. We'd go on outings and things like that and uh, go to London and go to the fashion sh so shows that were there in those days, you know, we so quite good. George, I've really enjoyed talking to you and um, thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. I'm glad that I've been able to get insight into the back-to-back -back houses in Birmingham. Thanks for inviting me. I appreciate our little talk and um, I will come back at any other time. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.